We did it! We finally got access to GPT-3. It's been eight months since I made my first video on GPT-3 and it's exciting to finally have access to the playground. I'm gonna show you what the GPT-3 interface looks like, what it's like to interact with the documentation and what it's like to actually build our very first GPT-3 application. I'm super excited to show you what I found. So let's dive into the playground and take a look around. So the main application is really oriented around the playground. That's really where you spend the majority of your time. And this is where you type basic text that you want GPT-3 to interpret and figure out how to complete. So if I say something simple like, this is a test, and I hit the submit button, it will then try to complete that test. So it says, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is only a test. So again, very simple example. Over here on the right, you can see what you can change in terms of parameters. There is the GPT engine, and there's a number of different engines. The engines will behave slightly differently, and they also have different costs associated with them. So the DaVinci engine is currently the most sophisticated with some of this beta engine being worked on as well. In addition to the engine, there's the response length, the temperature, which is how random a particular response is. If you want multiple responses, it can go through those responses with best of. There's frequency penalties and uh, presence penalties, and this helps GPT-3 reduce repeatability. So sometimes it'll get stuck in a loop where it keeps repeating the same phrase over and over. And so some of that will help prevent that. If you're doing a chatbot or something similar to that, you can have an inject start question and inject restart text, and you can also have stop sequences. So whenever a GPT-3 will predict a carriage return or stop sequence, it will stop the submission. So it won't continue to type additional text. Each uh, time you run GPT-3, GPT-3, it will actually try to create a new result and you can actually see what the probability of the different results are. If you want it to be less random and more predictable, you can turn some of the temperature down. When you have the full spectrum of probabilities, you can actually hover over words and see how likely GPT-3 thought that word was going to occur. And this helps it determine the probability of each particular sentence or phrase. And it also shows you the tokens or how much it would cost GPT-3 in terms of its tokens to actually generate that phrase. GPT-3 is based on token usage and the more complex a question you're asking it, the more tokens it'll take up. Obviously we could keep going, but that's the basics of the playground. There is a bunch of documentation in terms of GPT-3. There's a number of different engines you can use and you can read through the docs in terms of what it does and how it operates. The examples is an area where you can really find examples to try out. And each of these has basic prompt information, but all it really does is populate the playground. And so if I did English to French, if I opened up that translation example, it shows some of the prompts that it starts off with. And the key about GPT-3 is you prompt it, you give it a couple of these examples. And once it has some examples, it has a better sense of what you're expecting from it for the next time. So if I say, how do you get to the store? You can see it'll inject French and it'll inject a restart sequence and a stop sequence after that carriage return. So French, again, I don't speak French, but I'm assuming that's correct. In the examples, there's a bunch of different examples that you can kind of see through from classification, factual answering, product name generation, some of the spreadsheet examples that you saw previously, and things of that nature. Right now, everything in OpenAI is in beta, so it's not really available for public consumption, but I wanted to dive in and build an application that would actually be useful. I've been trying to use the command line more as my day-to-day -day interface, so I'm dragging and dropping files less and able to keep my hands on the keyboard. The problem with using the command line is some of the commands are very obscure. So I wanted to build a little bot to help me find the right command line tool for the job. And so I started with a project I called Command Line Tutor. And um, basically I gave it some prompts to give it examples. I said, I'm a command line translation tool, ask me what I'll do and I'll give you the Unix command. And so I used the sample that was very similar to the French to English. And so I had the English phrase and I was translating it into the command line phrase. And so this was a simple example example and you can ask it questions like um, how do I play an mp3 file and it'll tell me the command line way to actually play that mp3 file so let's say I wanted to install a particular utility or tool set a question mark and hit submit 
So it gives me a pretty complicated command line. I probably wouldn't have been able to remember. I'd have to look that up. So again, the idea is this will keep me in the command line. From here, what I did is I took the code. And so GPT-3 gives a code export. And so you can export it either as a Python block of code, or it also gives you a curl command, which you can use in the command line as well. And so literally you can copy this text and let's open up terminal and we'll paste that in. And you can see once you paste in the command, it'll actually execute that exact command. So you can see it's calling curl, it's passing the temperature, the tokens, the information. So what I did is I started with a tool called Google Collab. I'd never really programmed in Python before and Google Collab is a notebook based environment which makes it really easy to paste in Python code, debug it, run it and see how it works. And so really I pasted my code in here and started playing around with it. You can create questions, you can put a little if else conditional statements and then you literally run it right in the browser. So you don't have to do any complex Python installation or versioning. It makes it really simple to get started. And so I did have to enter in my API key. As I mentioned, every developer tool requires an API key. So unfortunately, this is still in beta. It's only available to people who have that access. And now I can really play around with it. So I can ask questions, you know, how do I put my computer to sleep? I've run that command. And over here, if everything's working, it'll tell me what I need to do. So, oh, it thinks the platform is Linux. And this is one of the things I figured out earlier early on is that if GPT-3 was prompted with the platform that are running on either Linux or Windows or Mac, it would produce much better results, much more consistently returning the right thing. So now that it knows I'm on a Mac, that's actually the right command. I'm not going to put my computer to sleep right now, but it gives better results. And so as you prompt GPT-3 with better information, it's better able to complete those phrases, complete those questions with the appropriate text as well. So this gave me a base line of my application. And as soon as I had that working, I was able to put it into an actual program. And so this is a little more sophisticated. It doesn't do too much. Again, like I said, I'd never really programmed Python before, but I added some options, some command line switches uh, that were useful for me. I have made the code available up on GitHub. So if you're interested in checking out, give me some feedback, telling me what I did wrong in Python, I'd really appreciate that. Like I said before, you do need an open AI API key. It won't work without that. I'm hopeful that in the future, OpenAI will provide end user keys to make it easier for open source software developers to publish some of the things that they're creating with OpenAI. So the core of GPT-3 is a very sophisticated autocomplete. So when you're designing a prompt or playing with a playground, you want to give it as much contest so it can complete the text as possible, whether it's helping it understand that it's a translation bot or helping it understand the context that Mac is different from Linux, is different from Windows, those contextual clues improve the percentages of the different words that it's choosing between and helps it get the right phrase and helps it have the right context. I found that AI is excellent and will get some very sophisticated actions and applications that you may be looking for. It can often guess what you're trying to type before you finish the entire command. And this is a great way to speed up typing instead of having to type all the characters. You just type a couple characters, often a letter or two, and have it autocomplete. Now, perhaps what's most surprising is that actually GPT-3 generated that last paragraph. I didn't write that. So uh, it is kind of impressive that it can do those things. It doesn't always get it right. In fact, I've had a lot of examples where I prompt it with a particular phrase or text or string and it either gets repetitive, gets stuck in a cycle, or it just doesn't quite make sense. So sometimes it does require the author to tweak some of the parameters, tweak some of the training. So here are my five big takeaways from building my first GPT-3 application. Number one is getting started is incredibly easy and it's incredibly fun. I played around with how AI can be applied to ordering systems, explaining medicine in plain English, grammar correction, and a number of other different experiments, including Seinfeld fan fiction scripts. I'm excited because there's a lot of interesting applications and the technology is incredibly accessible. It doesn't take a lot of technical sophistication to play with the playground and get really useful results, useful answers out of it to really inspire and trigger some imagination for next steps and creative projects as well. Number two, 
too is it's not magic and it's certainly not perfect. It would often go off on a tangent, occasionally get stuck in a loop, and there are controls to just how it'll perform, but tweaking these controls often seems to be an art, not exactly a science. Number three, developers should really think of OpenAI as infrastructure. Similar to AWS and Azure, it provides the pieces of functionality for your product or application, but it's also a dependency and a point of failure. If you're starting a business, you should really think about how you can really create defensibility and a moat on top of this infrastructure and how to create defensibility in your product long term. Because the technology is so accessible, more and more applications will be using this type of tool within their products over the years to come. So thinking through the differentiation of your product and how you really leverage this technology is going to be really important for developers. Number four, after playing with GPT-3, I'm even less concerned about the technology becoming self-aware and trying to take over the world like Terminator. I'm really impressed, but it still has a long way to go. The PT in GPT stands for pre-training. In the current version, you're not really able to upload your own large sets of data to fine tune the model. This is something that OpenAI is working on, but for the time being, the playground gives you an experimentation playground, but it doesn't allow you to upload very large sets of data. There are other APIs that OpenAI has made available for search and classification that do allow you to upload larger volumes of data, but for the time being, completion type playgrounds don't don't allow some of the fine tuning. So it's still super impressive, but it does have some ways to go. Lastly, we're at the start of something really big. If someone with no prior Python experience can whip together an app that harnesses the collective knowledge of the web, just imagine where professional engineers, development teams, and startups can go with this technology. I'm Greg Rays. If you want to see more content like this, let me know by subscribing or leaving a comment. I love talking about technology, entrepreneurship, and design. I'll see you in the next one.